are we live? And it's an exciting time to be here. Awesome. Hopefully some people will be hopping on soon. Help us celebrate your book launch. It's a big, big day. It is. It is because it's a journey and this is a big milestone. <laughs> it's real. It is. It is. So we have an agenda. We're going to walk through. I'll, I'll go through that um, in a little bit, Vicki, but you know, this is the second time that we've been on this journey together, you know, after your first book and then launching this book now. And um, I just wondered what, what was, uh, how this book was different from the first book. Do you want to talk to that a little bit? Oh my goodness. Um... The first book I modeled after a class I had already been teaching. Mm. So I had the chapters, I had the content. It was just transforming it into book format versus, you know, virtual teaching format. Right. Um, I still had to navigate all the nerves of doing a book, <laughs> what this means, and, you know, oh my gosh, right. I'm doing it. Um, and then this book, Heart to Heart, it is, I've been doing this 21 years professionally, and so it's 21 years of content that I pulled together to um, go through every stage of life for people, how they can best support their pet, and so I had no initial framework, and um, it was amazing how it all flowed and all came together to what it is today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk more about that as we get into it. So what this is going to look like is we're going to, I'm going to announce, introduce Vicki and, and her new book. And uh, then we're going to talk a little bit more about it, about, um, what's in the book and how it came about and just dig in more to the real heart space that this came from. And then uh, Vicki, you're gonna do a reading, right? In yeah. a little bit. Uh, so read some of the actual books so people can get a real flavor for what's in there and what they can expect and what they can learn about in the book. And then we'll give people who are attending an opportunity to ask some questions. Yeah. So that can be anything from, you know, something about the book um, to something about your pet, you know, Vicki's the expert. So this is the time to <laughs> ask your questions. <laughs> so Vicki, I'm really pleased that you wanted me to be on here with you today because we have been on this journey together for so long. And, uh, you know, I know how much of yourself you've poured in to this book. And I'm super proud as your book coach to, to be at this day when I can help you celebrate and launch this beautiful new book, Heart to Heart. So for the first time for this book anyway, second book in the series, but that you're author of your second book. So um, let's celebrate that. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Anybody who's, please, please share your, your excitement and your, your thoughts with Vicki um, about, uh, about the book and this huge accomplishment, becoming an author for a second time. Yeah, I didn't realize the journey the second time was going to be uh, as big as the first time. Um, but it was actually even more so, it felt like. Because it's like, yeah. ah, this is real. Okay. <laughs> so we're bumping it up a whole new level. Yeah, yeah. Marcy says, woohoo. <laughs> so <laughs> getting some getting some celebrations in here. You know, it's really great, um, everyone who's watching, to just help, help Vicki celebrate 
leave a kind word about uh, you know how she's helped you with your pets, uh, what you're looking forward to in the book, and just uh, give her some love. This is this is a big day and a big deal. So Sarah, Sarah Hart says, so exciting, Vicki, congratulations. So you're getting some love, Kathy Jensen. So thanks everybody. Would you like to, to respond, say something, Vicki? I know, well, hey Sarah, hey Kathy, thank you guys for supporting me and being here. I know, um, I feel blessed to have support and have a team and community. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know there are a lot of grateful pet lovers out there <laughs> that you've helped over the years in your classes, through your book, now this second book, and just one on one support, too. Yes. Yes. And that's why I'm passionate about writing this book or my other, my books in general. Um, but especially this one, because heart to heart, it really does come from my heart. And um, I'm all about empowering the pet guardian the best, with the best they can to take the best care. And then knowing there are professionals that can help as well. But there's a lot of things you can do at home with a pet guardian. And I love being able to help many more pet guardians and pets with this knowledge. Is that yeah. way I, I can serve more with my book or my essences than in my private sessions. So this is a way that I can really get out there and help reach many more people and animals. Yeah, you can make that bigger impact. Yeah. And that's yeah. what means a lot to me because the animals and their their happiness, their well being, and then their that extrapolate to their guardians because the more the calmer and better the pets are doing, then the, the guardians feel that much better. And so um, right. I love having, help having that impact on both. <laughs> right. So Vicki, I know you share this story um, and people who know you will know this story, but um, why don't you give people a little bit of background about why you are so passionate about helping pets and, and your, your connection uh, as a healer? Um, I was actually born with this wiring and this passion um, and actually being a natural born healer and communicator um, and not really knowing that because there was no uh, language that I, what I was doing naturally was actually a gift. And um, so when I was 11, I had a kitten that got diagnosed with distemper. And as a child, I'm like, no, I don't want that. It basically, he was given a week to live. And I'm like, not on my watch. <laughs> um, not understanding really death and stuff at that time, but I just didn't want my kitten, kitten to live and be happy. And so I went and did what was natural to me. And I can remember to this day, the healing energy kicking in Coming in, we had this surreal moment of white light just embodying both of us and just a beautiful heart-to-heart -heart connection. And my kitten rebounded and lived many more healthy years. And as a child, I didn't think anything about it because it was like, that's just natural. I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, it wasn't until I went off in computers and my head could do it that my heart was got to where it was wanting more. And so I really had to align with the animal again and that that story I got remembered about that and remembered about other um, that the neighborhood dogs that would bite others were always nice to me and you know, <laughs> it's like so I've just always had this nice rapport with the animals they knew I got them and um, I'm always honored that they trust me to help them mm. yeah I think that really shows through in so many of the stories in your book because that's one thing I love most about your book is that you share a lot of stories. And I see, I see a, a familiar name. Um, uh, Sally is on, and I know her pets are mentioned <laughs> in both books. Okay. So, yeah. So I know that, you know, the stories really helped you help me connect with how this actually looks in real life. How do I actually do it? So, 
Um, so this book, we talk about, you know, the difference in your experience in kind of writing the two different books, but how did this book originate? Like why, what made you feel so strongly about this information that you needed to do the hard work of actually writing the book? Um, my work entails actually helping the pet and their guardians through all stages of their life. Mm -hmm. And so that even means with the death and transition and then getting the next pet that's coming into their home. And, you know, so I have some really long time legacy clients and it's, I just felt it was important to let people know that there are things you can do just because, just because you're a kitten doesn't mean there's not things that need to be done. And my own cat is an example, Sapphire, um, the one that's not on the cover. She's a Siamese looking <laughs> Um She has low back issues. And as a kitten, she couldn't even jump on the counter. Well, kittens can jump all over the place. And so, you know, there's some stuff that needed to be done with her low back with massage and stuff. And I teach that in the book. Um, you know, so people don't think that even kittens or puppies can have issues, but they can. And so um, I take people through each stage, what they can do to support and be aware that their animals may need support um, at all ages. And so I'd also share a wellness protocol to keep your pets happy and healthy um, through all the stages. And so there is a, um, well, there's a chapter on things to think about even before you get your pet in your home. If you want, you know, if you're starting at that stage, basically the book is gonna help you wherever you are, whatever stage you are with your animal. Um, right. and, um, and so then it goes through, there's a whole chapter on pain management for like aging. And then there's a whole chapter on the transitioning process, how to help them at the end of life. And then there's, um, like I said, things to do daily and just enjoying every moment with them. And so that every moment can be beautiful because it's life. We as people typically outlive our pets. They have a shorter lifespan. And so it's important for me that the animals get that care and that love through all the stages. And like I said, again, empowering the pet guardians so that they're not lost because I mean it can be an emotional roller coaster when your pet's not feeling well. Right. Right. And just to make sure that people know that the book isn't just it's not just how to's. <laughs> um, you know, there are stories <laughs> cat, <laughs> cat appearance on the live. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't even staged. <laughs> life, life in the Draper household. That's right. I love it. But you really talk about how to how to bond and how to understand your animal, how to have that that um, that empathy and compassion to understand what's going on, so that you can best care for the animal rather than just you know, step by step, do this, do this, do this, do this, but tune in. So yeah. can you talk a little bit more about, about that and, and how this book is different than just, you know, your, your others, other books that might just be a, here's what to do when X happens. Yeah. Yeah. This is, um, well, it's the journey. It is the journey. And so it is also helping um, you understand what your cat or dog may be thinking or feeling and to help from their perspective because we tend to forget that and we take it for granted that we know things yet our cat or dog doesn't. And so they may be freaking and so it helps you really be aware of how to think of them and how to help them in ways that you, you might not think about. And I've actually picked out some examples of that to do some reading here in a minute. Okay, great. Good. We'll get to that. And I know of a few people who have, you know, you have really helped through helping them really understand their animal. Yeah. Instead of assuming that this behavior means something, um, that it, it may be signaling something else. Mm -hmm. 
So that's invaluable. So you did talk about the different parts of your, of your book, uh, and it basically covers the entire lifespan from getting a, a new pet and bringing them into your home and thinking about all different kinds of things. Like um, one of the things that I learned a lot from this book was how to take into consideration your existing pets when you're bringing a new pet in. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Yes, because many people, um, they think their pet automatically wants a mate. And oh. that's not necessarily the truth. And sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. When they don't and you try it, it's mayhem. Um, and so it's really getting clear, like, is it you really wanting a new puppy or a new kitten um, because your other animal is older or... You know, is it really getting it for your existing animal? Right. And there's a big nuance in there because if they're content bringing in another four-legged being, it it might not be as happy and <laughs> playful as you're hoping. <laughs> right. So you're saying that, you know, Spot or Fluffy doesn't automatically need a companion. They're not necessarily lonely. They might be just perfectly happy being the only pet in the house. Yes, yeah, because our animals have personalities and dispositions just like we as people do. Some animals are more social and some animals aren't. And so some animals are content being the center of attention and don't want to share. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes me think of all those people in large families, you know, they didn't, they wanted maybe one or two siblings, but you know, <laughs> maybe not as many as they got, right? <laughs> so, okay, well, we're going to have people ask some questions. So people who are on the, on the live, welcome, glad you're here and be thinking of uh, any questions that you might want to ask Vicki and we'll, we'll jump to those in a little bit, but right now, I think, Vicki, you said you had a reading. I do, and it matches what we were talking about because um, I felt like this is an important message to start with. And so it was a great segue because you didn't know what I had picked to read. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in my book, um, Mishka was one one year old when Katrina brought six month old Niles into the household. Their guardians, Brenda and Katrina, thought Mishka needed a playmate. The trouble initially was that Mishka was not happy at all with the new addition. Mishka was a quiet cat. He was extremely stressed and quit eating. He was so grumpy that they had to keep the cats separate. Niles was a happy go lucky kitten and ready to play. Brenda and Katrina were not getting anywhere with integrating the cat and were beside themselves with stress, concerned they were going to have to rehome Niles. This is when they called me to help. Mishka would not eat when Niles was near and would kiss if Niles came near him. Once I explained to Mishka that Niles was there for him, he softened. He accepted Niles more and more. They went from being out only a short amount of supervised time together to being able to be together unsupervised all the time. Initially, Mishka knew how to play with his human guardians and did not know how to play with another cat. Niles would keep trying to engage with Mishka and Mishka did not want anything to do with Niles. Now Mishka and Niles play and tumble together, eat together and snuggle together. Mishka has come full circle. Sometimes Mishka initiates play and Niles is not in the mood. Brenda and Katrina are immensely happy cat guardians. And I have a picture, a little show of them snuggling <laughs> and happy. Um, I wanted to share um, the next piece was preparing for a new home. Because there are things you can do before you actually bring your new animal into the household. And um, it's talking about a place where I did this with my own cat, Spirit and Sapphire. Uh, I did this process with them. So you'll hear that reference. So it says, 
just as I communicated and prepared Spirit and Sapphire for their new home with Miranda and me, Sarah received this treatment too. So I'm going to show Sarah. Sarah, yes. Yeah. And so Sherry is a longtime client who was between dogs before Farah, a six-year-old whippet, came home to Sherry's. We had a communication session to prepare Farah for her new home and new life with Sherry and Rob. Farah was a breeding dog. She was used to being put in her crate often and not much, not given much love, companion, attention. Some show dogs are treated like parts of the family too, but not all of them. Some are treated as breeding and show dogs as their only purpose, period. In Farrah's case, she was coming from a strictly breeding show dog environment to a loving pet home environment. Sherry is a conscientious pet guardian and wants to honor her pet's wishes. So we connected with Farrah, helping her process the transition of leaving her pups and going to her new forever home. We blessed her and helped her understand that her puppies were going to their safe, loving places, too. One particular puppy of hers was highly sensitive, and Farrah wanted extra protections around her, so we did that. We established that Farrah wanted to ride in the back seat of the car on the way to her new home. We gave Farrah a virtual tour of her new home by showing her the space energetically before they arrived. Farrah would not go in the kitchen because she was not allowed in the kitchen where she came from. I showed her that it was allowed in her new home. She was not allowed on the couch where she came from, so I showed her she was invited to be on the couch with Snuggles. Also, she was not allowed on the bed where she came from. She ate, slept, lived mostly in her crate. Farrah was invited to sleep on the bed in her new home if that was her choice. I showed her she was going to her new home with new rules. And we have Spirit trying to get in here. Spirit <laughs> making an appearance <laughs> again. <laughs> um, so I, I received a photo of her first day at her new home where she had tried out her new cave bed, dog bed, the couch, and the guardian's bed, getting acclimated to her new home. I saw photos of her snuggling both of her guardians. The prep session really allowed this opening and freedom for her to integrate so easily and nicely into her new home. We also shifted the energy of the meaning of her crate. Up until her new home, the crate was where she was put to get out of the way. It was also where she slept and ate and spent a lot of time, while another dog received loving attention and was allowed to roam free. Sarah was clear that she wanted a new crate, not the one from her previous home. Her new crate and her new home became her light palace, and she feels like a princess. And these were Farrah's descriptions. <laughs> um, she got used to being on the couch, and during her session, she energetically laid her head on Sherry's lap. She loved Such love flowed through. It brought tears to my eyes. She was getting used to being shown and given love and affection. Farrah was not used to playing with toys, so Sherry and Farrah get to explore what and find what she likes. So it's a new adventure for both of them. Yes. Oh, we have Sherry. Sherry jumping in now. She says, Farrah was so pleased to be able to feel welcomed to our house through Vicki's support, knowing she was leaving her pups. And she totally navigates the kitchen, sofa, and bed all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an awesome follow-up on, uh, on your story about Farrah. There's a couple of great yeah. photos of Farrah. People do it a thought to give a virtual tour, but that is, that can be key. Right. And by virtual tour, you mean like you were kind of showing in your mind, showing, showing Farrah pictures of, of what her new house looked like. Yeah. So she'd feel comfortable once she got there. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's what she was showing me, not wanting to go in the kitchen. And I'm like, no, in this house, it's okay. Um, yeah. And so. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, so before we jump into questions, um, if you've got questions, please put them in the in the comments in the chat so we can so we can look at those. But why don't you tell people, Vicky, how people can get a hold of the book? Okay. If you would like an autographed copy, you go to my website www.healingyouranimal.com and that's h-e-a-l-i-n-g-y-o-u-r-a-n-i-m-a-l.com 
select products and select books, and then you'll see um, both of my books there. And so then you can select heart to heart and get your autographed copy. And it is available live now on Amazon. So if you don't want to wait for an autograph, <laughs> you can go to amazon.com and get your copy and it's available in Kindle. And so they're both live today. And the easiest way to find it on Amazon is to type in my name, um, Vicki Draper, V-I-C-K-I, space D-R-A-P-E-R, under books, and then they will show up. And both of my books uh, are available in paperback or Kindle. And so Amazon has those. Yes, awesome. Uh, so Sarah had a question. Okay. Uh, she says, is there a way of telling when a cat is in pain? I have a whole section on how to tell if a cat's in pain in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, they stop doing their normal activities. If they may, uh, for a cat, you know, crouch more, um, they may not eat as much. They may not groom as much. They may not play as much. Um, there's different um, different ways to tell. Yeah, there's and there's uh, dogs may be different, right? Than than cats. They're good at these critters are good at hiding their pain. They are. That's what I was just going to say. You're reading my mind. <laughs> that cats hide it more than dogs. And so when it's a what you're aware that a cat's in pain, you really don't want to muck about, mess about. You know, you need to be on the phone call with your vet, and because they really hide it. Um, and then the obvious symptoms are if they're limping or not moving as clearly. And dogs, they yeah, they won't jump. I guess that is similar to you. They won't jump where they normally do. You know, they're they're just their normal activities are not being done regularly and they may look mopey. You may see it in their eyes, but they just look kind of dull versus bright. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so a big one with the dogs is they're not gonna play like they normally play, you know, their favorite, or they don't wanna go for a walk like they normally do, um, big indicators. Yeah, you know something's wrong when they don't wanna go for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when normally they're at the door panting, waiting. <laughs> Right, right. Let me see if we've got other questions. So pop in there with any questions you've got either about the book or about caring for pets. We've got Vicki, who's the expert at all of that right now. Yeah, and while we're waiting, I'll share one more thing from the book. Sure. Um, because it's a powerful, it kind of flows with the new integrating the new cat into your home um, is a technique called forever home. So like I was saying, you know, they're coming in, you're adopting them, they're going to be with you forever. They don't, especially if they've been through multiple fosters or um, that any animal, they just don't know that the change is coming. And so um, forever home is a powerful tool, especially for animals being rehomed or rescued. Rocky, a 10-month-old Labradoodle, was nervous, unsettled, confused, and sad. His previous guardian was crying when she dropped Rocky off to his new home with Heidi. Rocky did not know why he was at Heidi's. He was confused about what was happening. He would not eat much. He did not know if his prior guardian was coming back. And he carried that confusion and sadness when I met him. I'll show you this picture. Rocky. Um... Rocky's prior guardian and Heidi both knew this was Rocky's new home, but Rocky was still confused. He started talking to Rocky about the heavy sadness he was carrying. He was open to letting it go and he released it. His sadness turned out to be his prior guardian's sadness that he was carrying for when she dropped him off. And Rocky liked Heidi and liked her being with her. And during his session, as soon as he understood he was staying with Heidi and he was in his forever home, that cleared his confusion, he knew what was happening and he immediately started eating. So, um, 
another example of where we take it for granted. We think, you know, we know it, but our animals don't. And so when we get that clear for them, things go much better. Right. And your book is full of success stories like that. Yes. You know? And it's yep. yeah. it gets to use. Yes. Yeah. I know so many times people get to a point where they are so frustrated or worried or, you know, bothered by a problem that they're having with their animal that they think there's, there's no light at the end of that tunnel. You know, there's, or maybe there's nothing they can do. And I think your book sheds light on all of those situations where there, things can change and so much for the, for the better. So, um, Marcy comes in with a question about does the book uh, cover with cover how to deal with death of a pet? Yes, Marcy, thanks for asking. It does. I have a whole chapter, a whole chapter of um, how to navigate that, what to expect, and you know how to know what to do when it's time and how you hold that love and connection, how you can make it a sacred, blessed passing um, and peaceful versus uh, unsure, you know, nervous and rattled. Because yes, pet, our pets, they, they deal with death and navigate death differently than we do. And so just understanding how they think about it, um, it just gives you a peace of mind and helps you can make that a beautiful transition. Yeah, that's a beautiful chapter and helps, I think, helps people be present with the animal in the state that they're going through rather than to be in denial or something like that. It helps them be present and really be with their animal until, until the end. It's a gift. So uh, Sherry has a question. Uh, can you share any tips about how to help a pet ahead of time when the guardian has to travel or be away from home for a time, so for example, either it's vacation or surgery or something like that. Ah, yes, so that is in the book too. <laughs> so, um, a powerful technique is um, our animals know days and night. They don't know it's Monday or Tuesday or three days. They just know days and nights, sun rises and sun sets. And so um, before you get your suitcase out to travel, because that freaks a lot of animals out because they know that means you're leaving and they don't know what's happening. And so you want to share with blinks. So when you're blinking your eye, that's giving them a night and opening them up at the daytime. And so you share the number of days and nights before you leave, you show them a visual, you just imagine yourself with your suitcase leaving out the door, and you're showing them then the number of blinks for the number of nights you're going to be away. And then you show them when you open your eye on that last blink, you're coming back in the door with your suitcase and greeting them. And so when they know that they're just so settled once they get that last piece of information that when you're coming home, with your suitcase, they see it, they know it, they relax. And if you're having a pet sitter or they're going to be boarded, you want to share that information with them so that they know what to expect and that they're taken care of. And, um, and then also while you're gone, if you're connecting with them with your heart, they will feel it. So then it's like you weren't really gone in the first Beautiful. Thanks, Vicki. So if you have any other questions, now's the time to ask them. Oh, we're not going to do the surgery for the animal. Like if they're staying at the vet, you let them know and you let them know you're coming to pick them up. They will be coming home. And then clearly if it's toward the end and they might not be coming home, you don't want to tell them they're coming home if they're not. So, you know, because they're, they're literal. They, they, they aren't like us that we say one thing can mean another. They are literal. So when you tell them, you, you've got to follow through. And so you can share with them 
you know, we're going to the vet, we're going to see, and they're going to take the best care of you, you know, if it is. Um, but sometimes you don't know that it's the last trip, but you see your best, just like we always do. And our animals, they know we're doing our best because they can sense that. And so they, they don't hold grudges. A lot of people worry about that. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> good point. Other thoughts on that, Vicki? Um, if, well, just share the information you have and that you know, um, mm -hmm. because they, they, they navigate it much easier. Um, like I'll be doing this soon. My cat spirit's got to go in and get some teeth extracted. So I'll be showing him, taking him in. He's gonna, I'm gonna show him. He's gonna feel a little groggy, you know, his mouth's gonna feel a little funny when he wakes up. And then I will be coming to pick him up and he'll be coming home. Um, so, you know, go through as much detail as you can. Yeah, it's just the same kind of stuff we would wanna know. Right. If some major change is happening in our lives. Yeah, uh, it's much easier if you can anticipate it rather than if it's just thrust upon you all of a sudden you don't know what's going on. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So Vicki, I want to ask you uh, on your second book now that you and I know you have it actually in your hand. How does it actually feel to have your have your second book in your hand after all the hard work you've done? Oh my gosh, it feels surreal. You're it, dancing. I know, it feels surreal. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, this is a soul calling because this is my soul work. I mean, I am so passionate about helping the animals and their people. And um, just knowing that they now have this tool to, to use um, it just warms my heart. It just makes me feel good that, because I know it's going to, it's, it's, I mean, it's full of value. It is full of 20 years, over 20 years in private practice and what works and how to navigate it. And that just fills me with joy. Yeah. And that really comes across in the book too. Uh, I, I feel like you get much more vulnerable about about your own connection with animals and your where you come from from the heart and your your uh, real connection with animals. You, you you put it all out there in this book. Yes, I did. I, yeah. <laughs> and here's uh, I already have a testimonial before it got released, so now people can get it. But um, with the editing process, there's a two phase editing. So Amy was my main editor and then it went through another editor named Jennifer. And her comment, she came back with, well, everything happens at the perfect time. I ended up having to save a dog from choking this weekend. This book gave me the confidence that I could make that happen and everything turned out well. And I, that to me was a big sign from the universe that it's already helping dogs or helping animals before it's even released, so just how much more benefit is it really going to have? Right, that is an amazing story. I, I couldn't believe that when Jennifer shared that with us, that she was, you know, and I think she also said um, that she got a cat. She got a new pet after she read the book. <laughs> okay, I heard she was thinking about it. It gave her the idea that maybe she would do that. Yeah, no, I think she actually did. <laughs> Good. <laughs> So that's exciting. And so if people are wondering, there is a whole, there is a chapter or a section on emergency, what to do in emergency situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And even what to do on the way to the emergency room to keep your pet calm and, and, um, you know, out of that state of shock or panic or whatever. So that's, that's a, a brilliant section too. So um, Jody wrote in and said, I would love to know one of your favorite or most Powerful stories of work you've done with an animal and it's human. Oh my gosh. You have so many. I have so many, I know. So the most. Wow, that's dumping me, Jody. <laughs> <'Cause>... 
<laughs> there are so many, but you know, I'm going to say, I'm going to pick the death process because when I can help the guardian reframe that this is this horrible thing happening and their pet is feeling their sadness and wondering what they've done wrong and reframing the pet to say, you know, tell, I tell the pet, this is just what humans do, you know, that, you know they, they get sad, it's okay. And it brings peace. It's such, a, it's such a beautiful moment to bring that peace and connection with the animal and the person together before the animal transitions. I mean, it is such a beautiful switch because as people, we think differently or can be afraid of it. And when I can bridge that connection and then the animal has so much more peace, the person has so much more peace, it, it really is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, because as humans, you know, we'll relive that moment over and over again. Exactly. And to feel, go away from it feeling full and at peace is, is such a happy memory when it could have been another way, you know? So that's, that's a true gift that you help people with. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Vicki. And the other fulfilling, uh, Jody's got my wheel turning now, the other fulfilling, well, I'm fulfilled with all of it because anytime an animal looks at me, you know, in the session, it's like, thank you. It, because I know mm. it's made a difference. It's just, uh, it's precious to me. Um, <laughs> now I'm having a moment. Of, what was I even going to say? Because I got lost on the heart belt. <laughs> <laughs> I so looked like you were thinking of another story. I was going to. Okay. So when an animal comes to me and it looks like it is the end of their life. And it looks like it from the vet's standpoint. And when it is not the animal's time, which is deemed by you know, the higher powers, um, being able to have that transition and help the animal transition and rebound is beautiful as well i mean every everything's beautiful even from a behavioral issue to going to calm i mean but when you're thinking it's the end and then it, it there's more that's it's really beautiful too to be able to support that yeah and that ties right into your story that you told at the very beginning of your of your cat that um, you know you were told to have, had a week to live and lived many more years. That's true, and that's where I learned that Western medicine was good, but it didn't have all the answers. That there is more, mm -hmm. and so when we work with both, then it's a much richer result. Right, and so that's actually a good point. Um, do you? Do you think that people, this, this book alone or work with you alone is, is um, all they need for their animal? Do they also need veterinarian care? I highly encourage regular veterinary care as well because mm -hmm. it's a great compliment. We compliment each other um, because my work picks up where theirs leaves off. Yeah. And then they have the tests, they have all the things for us to know exactly what's going on in the body. And then we can target and work with it alternatively that much stronger. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just a beautiful combination. Awesome, yeah, I think that's a good point to make. So it's, it's a both and, not an either or. Right. <laughs> all right. Okay, well, let's, um, I want to let everybody know that I'll put the links to the, um, to the book, how to get a hold of the book, either on, on the Healing Your Animal website or on Amazon. Um, and Vicki, is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we 
close? I am just overjoyed that um, this tool is now available. This book is now available because it truly was. Well, it took me on a journey of opening my own heart. And so it was like, this is my heart to you and your pet. And then the book, Heart to Heart, is you and your pet, heart to heart connection. And, um, so it, it's a labor of love. <laughs> and it may be spirit and I are heart to heart connection on the cover. So, right. Yeah. Uh, he likes that loving energy. So. <laughs> Yeah, obviously he he came in a few times. <laughs> he would have he would have come more in. <laughs> <laughs> I love the black tail going across the screen. So, well, Vicky, I'm super happy for you that your book is now out there to the world. I'm I'm really really happy for all the guardians and animals who will benefit from your wisdom. And uh, just congratulations on this huge accomplishment and congratulations on being an author for the second time. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's been so real. Oh, I will say I do have an animal communication class coming up. If people are interested, it starts February 17th. Um, you can learn more of these techniques as well. Um, if you want something deeper than the book, the book is rich. <laughs> So yes. multiple ways to receive information and learning. All right. Well, you're getting lots of congratulations and good wishes on the comments. You can go look at those a little later. I will. And thank you for being here to support me um, and all of everyone that is here. Thank you. Thank you. Because... Um, it's just extra meaningful having support and um, well, this wouldn't be here if there wasn't for support. It, yeah, it's just, it takes a village to, <laughs> to create things. <laughs> so. Well, okay, I will share the heart to heart. There was another heart journey I did have while writing this book is my daughter, my only daughter, went off to college and so became an empty nester. And instead of empty nester, it's, um, it's like becoming time for more self-discovery. And so this book is my first, <laughs> a first of a big thing with this new, new phase of my life. filling up that nest <laughs> yeah with loving on many more animals and helping them even more <laughs> all right well we'll look forward to more books from you in the future yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i do have some plans so it'll be it will be fine right now i'm celebrating this one and yeah yeah all right so thank you for all your support, Amy. And You're welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure. And look forward to hearing all your feedback and how the book has helped. There's helping you. And keep on moving onward and upward. <laughs> yeah. And if you love it, please leave a review on Amazon too. That helps yeah. other people find the book and helps Vicki um, uh, be able to share her work with, with more people. All right. All right. Thank Thanks, everybody. Bye.